They're going to tell you not to do your work. Like that's foolish. Um, it's, it's ignorance and all of those, those type of things. And so, um, you got to remember once you start doing your work, everybody that's used to you being the old you are going to give you resistance to becoming your best you because if they don't want to do their work. They figure that they're going to sabotage you. So that's why in the, um, in the biblical uh, discourse to Christ, they say, uh, ain't that your brother and your sister over there or something, your brother and your mother? He said, huh? he said, a brother and my brother and my mother are those who do the works of my father. Now, <clears throat> once you start, once you get done with that one, you're going to have uh, Corpus Hermetica, which is a different version, right? Now, all these hermetic books, read them because they even though the information in some of them are dull and dry there's keys in there that's going to work on you on the subconscious level in all of the pieces of light it's like parts of a computer program that's on different disks and as you download one disk it goes to build onto the program so then um from there um there's some more hermetic books that i don't have on hand right now Okay, so now the Hermetics, um, I don't care whether they are a Mason, a Shriner, a Templar, a Catholic priest, or whatever it is, all of them study Hermetics. The enemy and the allies, they all of them, that's what they call initiated and at the top level, study Hermetics. Why do they all study Hermetics? Because it gives them an insight into the secrets that move the powers of the universe and how to harness that within the self in order to make an external expression which i'll call manifestation what is a manifestation is what when you bring something out of here into the physical world is manifestation and we all have that ability now when these internal processes start to kick in you're going to have strange dreams so that means that um you're going to have to know about what it is to be fit leaving the body. Why do you leave the body? What is this all about? Like Muhammad was in meditation on the night of the uh, Hijra and he was taken up. Ezekiel was in prayer and he was taken up. What do they mean? Well, they was taken out of a physical form in order to, to take the fear aspect out, in order to make you braver and bolder in the movement, you have to... Uh, um study the people that study the process and this is one of them this one's by d scott rogo um but there's another one um out of arizona um who really really started it uh the the study of it deep i can't remember his name right now but it come to me the monroe institute um sylvan monroe and he was the one who pioneered the research in the out-of-body experiences using scientific methods. But now, once that light start coming on, you're going to have all of this power surging within your body, and you're going to be restless. So you have to learn how to control it and focus it. So what do you do? Well, like this book right here, it's pretty good, and it's a good beginner's book. But it's called Learn to See an Approach to Your Inner Voice Through Symbols. Because all of the symbols that you uh, um, encounter, let's see, let's see. Yeah, all of the symbols that you encounter um, are trying to relay small pieces of information to you. If you don't know how to read them, you won't know what the information is in the conscious. Your subconscious still know what it is. You can't act on it until you're consciously aware that you that what it is once you make that bridge that subconscious um knowing with the conscious awareness that knowledge and awareness and then you can use the information other than that is useless information so then you learn to see internally now i got some more good books that's references for um um internal um perspective of these properties one of them right here um the mystic grimoire mighty spells and rituals now whether you use the spells and rituals in real time or not becomes irrelevant to understanding what 
the spells and rituals do to move energy in the physical world. So even if you're not, because some people are just not interested in doing conjure work, spells and rituals, but they need to understand the spells and rituals to know how the spells and rituals is moving. energy and they'll find that they don't they can work past the spells and rituals they call um um higher thought higher facilitated thought and this is where you connecting your thoughts from your kind and your subconscious mind so once you start learning that that's a good book um the uh, author of this book is freighter malik he got a lot of other good books freighter malik now <clears throat> when you go into the book we we'll go over some study um, things. You'll notice that the book is broken into parts. Parts. And these parts, like over here, okay, now those are like study modules, right? So this is a book that you study more so than a reference book. So now you take this part right here, this little small paragraph right here. It's a little small paragraph. And you read it. Um, is this one is going? Why are some people lucky and others unlucky? What? Is, and then it'll go into it. It's telling you about the movement of the energy between lucky people and unlucky. That's all it's saying. Don't get it caught up in the story. Look at the movement of the energy between the characters. It's the same when you're reading um, uh, autobiographies and biographies of people. Because you're really reading how the person is moving their energy to a successful place. That's why you study people in biographies. Okay, then another good book, once you start understanding the spells, and I love this lady, um, Silver Raven Wolf. Now, Silver Raven Wolf, this book right here is just one of her books. It's called To Light a Sacred Flame. And even though... Um, it's going over various conjure techniques. This book has a very um, like powerful effect on the divine feminine aspect of the individual male or female. And it's helping, that's why when you look at it, you see that that woman becomes the phoenix. That's telling you something. Her name is the Raven Wolf, the Silver Raven Wolf. Her name is telling you something. I'm not going to tell you what her name means because it might be a violation of her privacy. But it means something. And that symbols are not on this book. These books like this don't put the symbol on the cover haphazardly. It's a reason for that symbol. And um, just like on this one, the Totem Magic book, you'll notice that there's a panther on there. That's because the panther is the symbol of a priesthood. It's a specific priesthood out of Egypt, the, the Temple of Bast. You know, so um, then when you got to demystify that God concept, because the God concept is fictitious. Um, the God that they're talking about is one of the tribes of Israel named Gad. So um, the rules of grammar, it's the same word, exactly the same word, but it's transliterated instead of translated. And so one of the things that help you demystify it is this is a really good book for a reference material on the gods because you go in here, like um, people think that sin is a physical act. What sin is a deity. Sinner is a practitioner of the way of that deity. Like um, when you go in here, you can go straight to sin. Pull him up, and you will find out what he, where he at, where he came from, um, and what his strengths and powers are. In a lot of cases, and the next page here. Now, this right here, seeing moon god, Mesopotamian, Babylonian, Akkadian, right there it tells you that whoever seeing is he from Babylon. 
derived from the older Sumerian model of Nana, which is Inanna. His consort is Nikal or Ningal. He is symbolized by the new moon and perceived as a bull whose horns are crescent of the moon. So now when you look at the uh, at the symbol of Mary or the symbol of um, the side of Revelation chapter 12. So it's talking about seeing. Um, and then it's a cult centers are identified at Ur, Haran, and Nirab. What do they mean by cult centers? Well, you practice the rites of sin in those places, and they call them the cult center. Instead of calling them the church of sin, they call it the cult center of sin because they don't want you to ever pick this up in real time in mass because then they, it'll start to unravel the shoestring of oppression. So now you notice the first place it said is the cult centers are identified at Earth. I want y'all to be able to see that because this word Ur is a Chaldean word that literally means fire, right? So if you are a sinner, you have to already know that sin is the God that was worshipped in the city of Ur or the city of fire. Well, what that mean? In the city of Ur, there was a thing called Gehenna, which was a large hole in the ground. This hole in the ground was stoked with sulfur-covered embers of coals. And it was a, a disposal center for the area for, it was basically the landfill, except instead of filling the land, it incinerated the waste. So over time, they begin to punish criminals there it's where you get your weeping and gnashing the teeth because this was still going on 2,000 years ago. So now we know that sin is a God um, from the city of fire where they burn people with fire and brimstone. That's hell. Well, who is hell? Heliopolis. We are back into the Greeks now. So it send you on a chain reference. This thing ties to this thing. Now, what it's doing in your subconscious is creating a spider web effect. And that spider web effect is connected all to the information. And subconsciously, you gotta you got to find the answer. Now, the beginning question of your life was how do I find the kingdom of heaven within? And all of these bits and bytes of information you pick up along the way show you. Now, as you start to get a uh a little more advanced your material start to get a little more advanced now this was a motivational speaker anthony robbins this is a good book for beginners because it gives you some of the foundational ideas of mysticism without ever mentioning anything mystical related example is when he tells you about um you go into the index to a table of contents and he start the first section one, the modeling of human excellence. What do he mean by that? And is you know, he's when you talk about modeling, you you study a person's energy and how they move their energy. So you try to control your energy the same manner that they control their energy. They're your model. So you're imitating your model. This was the whole process or purpose of Egyptian deities being kept in stone and in um, glyph relief. And so you can learn about their energies and try to move your energy internally the way they did in order to have the external expression as an internal deity. So this is a real good um, beginner's book. And you can both read this straight through and go back to it as reference. This is what uh, I like to call it a dual research book. It's a good read and it's a good reference. Now, a lot of the um, people in the African-American community, there's another version edited by, I think the guy name is Claude Anderson. No, his name is, uh, I forget his name, but it's it's the same book but it has a lot of references to African-American things. It's called Unlimited Power of Black Choice. It's, it's an excellent book too, but it's it's like this information plus some 
African-American um, season into it, so to speak. So then um, you start to see things. As you start to see things, there's a couple things you need to be aware of. I talked to a, uh, one of the elders on the phone, Neely Fuller. And he was the one who gave me the piece that I needed to discover that the white supremacy doctrine was not, uh, um, it was an actual military strategy and that it, how it was laid down. Now, this book, The United Independent Compensatory Code Concept System, um, this is the textbook for breaking that white supremacist mentality. And one of the things that I noticed is that there was 10 parts to this book. In 10, 10 things that they try to control using the white supremacist model. Economics is the first one they try to control. Um, education is the second. Why The money and the babies are the first two things they're trying to control. Then it's, even though it's in alphabetical order, it is also true to the protocols, which we which you absolutely have to have protocols of the learned elders of Zion. And you want to get as close to the original copy as you can. And I'm going to go over that in a minute. But economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, um, sex, and war. Those are the nine areas of people activity. And I started looking at that lens, but I read the protocols first, right? So I already knew what the agenda was being laid down and how it was being effectuated. And um, from that, when I got this piece of information, it was making a whole lot of things connect because Francis Wells mentioned Neely Fuller in the ISIS papers. Now, notice her book is called The ISIS Papers, Keys to the Colors. That is not by accident either. And on the cover, there's a, a, a photograph of hieroglyphics. Um, so we'll start to unravel the puzzle using these models. Like when you put this next to the protocols and you follow that down in real time, like the word school is the same word as the, the Yiddish word sheol, it's Yiddish shul. It's Hebrew sheol. It's the same word. And what's the difference in the Hebrew and the Yiddish? Is that the Yiddish is spoken by those Europeans who does not have a craniofacial structure, and the um, um, vocal range to pronounce the Hebrew word in its original language, meaning their tongue is not heavy enough to properly pronounce it as Hebrew. So where they became deficient, they added they added uh, Latin, Spanish, and French words into the Hebrew to soften up the tongue so they can pronounce the words. And so um, when I started putting that together, he came out years later with a compensatory counter-racist codified word guide. Now remember, the words tell you the energy and how it's being used. This is like a dictionary to unravel that doctrine. So now we got these two and we got the protocols. Then it started to dawn on you that, wait a minute, this ain't what they told us it was and this is not what's going on. So this is like the, the, the beginning. This is the beginning. This is like a foundation that I'm laying for you here. Now, then you had those that were like, well, all this learning is fine and I can learn how to do the spells and different things, but I want to manifest. Well, what's a good book for beginners in manifestation? A good book um, is Hidden Secrets. That's a really good book. The Hidden Secrets of... Um, okay, this is by Carl Nagel. Now, he got some more books for the beginner that's excellent. And that book, The Secret, the whole secret to the secret is they're not going to never tell you what the secret is. You got to remember that. You can read the whole book a thousand times and they're not going to never tell you what the secret is. So the, I'll tell you what the secret is. The secret, right, your purity of heart and your clarity of thought connecting in order to produce something physically, 
You have to have that purity of thought and that sincerity of heart. When you match them two, and it's almost like saying B. When you visualize it and you say B, and you have to do like a, a, a physical um, expression to bring it from the psychological or the mental realm into the physical. And that's what they use. The ritual is just to anchor the idea, concept, and energy into the physical three-dimensional world. That's the holy purpose of the ritual. It's the only purpose of praying. It's the only purpose of meditating. It's to take what's going on in the spiritual mental matrix and bringing it into the physical three-dimensional reality. And so when you see them doing all of their Masonic rituals or satanic rituals,